Uncommon Sense with Junior Doan, sharing the wisdom and insight of those who have been there and done that. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Uncommon Sense a chance to be together and learn the wisdom of the people who sit down with me at this table to share what they've learned in their lives. With me today is Frank Popoff. Frank I've known for a number of years and admired all those years as well. What I like about Frank is his articulateness, his knowledge across a broad base of topics, his enthusiasm, and his concern for people. So welcome, Frank. Thank you, Junior. Thank you for being here with us. You've had a very interesting life, and it started, as it all did, at an early phase. And as I recollect, you were, well, they don't call it bi-coastal, but bi-continent. Bi what did that do to you as, as a child? Did you have to change yourself in any kind of a way? Well, you know, uh, what you experience and what you relearn in the telling kind of gets yeah. uh, mixed. But uh, I can remember coming to the United States. I can remember it took some months to get from Sofia, Bulgaria, to Italy, finally to uh, Genoa, finally through Gibraltar and to New York, Ellis Island, class of 1940, I count myself. And I can remember coming here and not speaking English and winding up in Terre Haute, Indiana, and wondering, is this a good deal? Right. My buddies are all back home. This language I don't understand but it didn't take long to really appreciate what we had. And I think my parents were terrific in saying, we're Americans now by virtue of where we are, and uh, we will speak English at home, and we'll do this and that or the other. It was a little broken, that English, for a while. But uh, I counted myself a Yank from the very beginning until I got old enough to be proud of my heritage as a Bulgarian, and that's another story. When you started, we've had a long career at Dow, as many of us know. Forty-two <laughs> golden years almost. But were you tempted to try another field beforehand? Had you? I, I, I never really thought seriously uh, once I made my career decision about anything but the chemical industry. I had an undergraduate degree in chemistry and an MBA, and uh, that was a natural. And then I met the Dow Chemical Company, and the rest was kind of history. I did think about a number of other things as an undergraduate. I really thought seriously for a while and applied to Georgetown uh, for their uh, foreign service school. But I'm glad I didn't because uh, I, I'm glad that we didn't connect because uh, uh, I've really had a gratifying and satisfying life and I like what I'm doing. But yeah, uh, it took me a while uh, to determine what I wanted to do. And I still get to universities often and people say, when did you figure out what you wanted to do? And I said, later than you can imagine. It took me a while to understand what I wanted to do. You know, as I said, you are so good to people, or at least my impression is you are. But what happens when you meet someone who is just, and I'm sure you've met a few of those, either stubborn or malevolent or um, uncooperative? What, are the, what has worked for you in... Well, in that I, kind of a situation. I try to understand why, Junior. Uh, uh, obviously, you can tell if the body language is unpleasant. Uh, malevolence is not pretty. It shows stubbornness equally so. Uh, the tendency to walk away uh, isn't very gratifying. So what you try to do is find out, well, what is on this person's mind? If you can find out, and sometimes it's not so easy, usually you can realize that Nobody really wants to be permanently nasty. So if you can find out what's wrong, often you can kind of get past that and into maybe something more meaningful. Uh, I've never been accused of being a great listener. I've been always told I talk too much. Uh, sometimes what you listen to isn't worth hearing, as you right. and I both know. <laughs> right. But uh, I do try to listen and pay attention, especially when someone obviously has a problem. If you do that, then I think the whole relationship issue gets a lot easier. Do you find by talking a lot it smooths the rough edges of other people? Well, uh, I find that uh, people will want to talk when they feel they have something to say. And the awkward pauses disappear when it's a subject close to their heart. 
So uh, I try to engage people and talk enough to find an area of interest. And that's usually pretty focused because you're together usually with a purpose and it doesn't take too much insight to find out uh, where is the area where they'd like to be heard. Then those awkward pauses and that uh, strained conversation somehow goes away. Goes away. When there are disappointing times in life or chronically challenging times, what do you tell yourself? I mean, well, you know, I, I always say it could be worse. Uh, it could be worse. I think that's what you have to say. Uh, uh, my dad had a lot of reversals in his life. He was quite a fine man and, and uh, a very capable and, and, and gifted man. But for political reasons, for economic reasons, uh, he had uh, gone from continent to continent, uh, uh, leaving behind Europe when the time was right on a number of occasions. And he taught me it could always be worse. Uh, He'd been in the military, he'd done a whole host of things, and uh, taught me it could be worse. And you know, it could be. We have so much to be grateful for that, uh, and, and you can do so little when you're down, huh? I don't know about That's what the I've rest of us, but if you're My energy down goes. the dumps, uh, A, you don't know what to do, and you're lousy at doing it. Uh, so uh, the world, Branch used to say, the world belongs to the optimist. I, kind of buy that 100%. So would you say that you, when, when things hit, you know, and you are down, is whatever it that happens. means, it's do true. you just pause then? Do you wait to you, and how do you get to a better, stronger I'm not place? known for patience, but yes, I do. There, there is a time to pause and be patient if it's only for a little uh, while. Too much of that, of course, uh, right. compounds the the uncertainty that goes with challenging times. So you don't want to wait too long, but you sure don't want to shoot from the hip either. So a little pause is highly appropriate. Do you figure things out intellectually, instinctively? Intuitively. Intuitively. You know, I, I don't know what the recipe is. Uh, uh, are we better by virtue of our wisdom or our judgment? I don't know. Uh, it's appropriate to have the facts. It's appropriate to know what to do with them. So. I think it's kind of a mix. Uh, I hope I'm intuitive because if you wait for all of the data, you're never timely. Right. If you wait for 100% assurance on any subject, uh, it's not a certainty that you're going to be timely having made the decision as late as you have by virtue of waiting for so long. So uh, I try to get most of the facts, but I try to conclude as early as I can, sure. And then act. Better do that. Yeah, I've never been accused of not acting. <laughs> Does uh, that relieve you when you act? Oh, sure. Because? Oh, sure. Well, uh, you know, I'm not a maximalist or a perfectionist. I wish I was. I, I, I'd like to be uh, close, but uh, I think improvement is what it's all about. Somebody once said, uh, uh, perfect is the enemy of better. Mm -hmm. And if I wait for perfection, I probably will be waiting forever and things don't get better. So sure, I like to act. I think it's appropriate. I think people appreciate it. Most of your problems aren't problems that you have by yourself. They involve other people. Mm -hmm. And I think they, if they look to you for a little guidance or leadership, they want to see activity. They don't want to see somebody close their door and uh, uh, hibernate and cogitate on a question forever. What, is, what does leadership look like to another person? How do they recognize leadership? Well, I don't know. Uh, 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 I think leadership uh, has been well defined. You know, it takes a vision. It takes an ability to articulate that vision. You have to have people who buy in and want to follow you. But so much has been sp said from the leader's standpoint. How about the followers? And I think, to your question, which is spot on, I think, uh, a follower wants to be engaged and feel that uh, it's a reciprocal situation. Hmm. The leader is going in the right direction, but he's listening to see if um, five degrees port or five degrees starboard is better than straight ahead. So I think a critical element that we don't hear enough about is that feedback loop mm -hmm. to the folks that are ostensibly following. And I've caught myself uh, at times being disenchanted with leadership because they wouldn't listen. 
even though I didn't know that I had anything to contribute. Mm -hmm. But just the process of listening. They weren't important. curious. Well, I think curious and suitably insecure because if a leader isn't a little bit insecure, then I don't think he's or she's perceptive enough in terms of doing the right things in the right way to get to the destination. So uh, I heard someone once say, it's a good idea to be uh, appropriately nervous at all times. I think that's a good, good what, idea. When you want to change something in your life, a direction, a project, um, a decision, what do you ask yourself? <laughs> uh, if I think I should have made a change, I should make a change, the first question I ask is, why didn't I do this sooner? Mm -hmm. uh, and in the process, I think you pretty much open up all of the factors that are pro and con. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if, if I assume uh, I want to buy a new car, I ask myself, well, if that's such a good idea, why didn't I do it sooner? Uh, there are lots of good ideas. And you find out that maybe your decision isn't so good. Maybe waiting a bit is longer, uh, a bit longer is better, or uh, gosh, maybe I should have done it sooner. But I think you have to test your decision to make a change and ask yourself that question. You know, uh, you've been in a leadership position a really long time in different venues, so different places. Um, and it seems you've talked a, a bit now about that. But when you get in a domestic situation, oh. right? I mean, are, are, I don't want to say are you the same. That's too personal, perhaps. But I mean, how, do, how does one have to modify oneself? Well, I think you have to understand that you're different people to, with different people. Uh -huh. uh, Gene and the boys used to take a great case uh, and a great delight in saying, well, <clears throat> Frank, uh, Dad, uh, this is a lesson in humility for you. Sure. <laughs> right. Uh, because you're reasonably successful in business doesn't necessarily buy you any extra uh, input on domestic issues. And I think it's a wonderful way to look at things. You know, you're qualified or disqualified to do certain things. And success in one field doesn't necessarily uh, make you, uh, uh, by definition, uh, authoritative in another. A lot of people believe that about themselves and think because I succeed in X, I'm going to be a natural in Y. A big mistake. Gene and the boys used to, t uh, used to give me a, a lot of, well, we used to have a lot of fun talking about the fact that uh, uh, the humanization of uh, dads when they come home was an important part of family relationships. How do they uh, do that? Oh, just by, you, we're just by kidding, you know. Right. Uh, uh, if humor is the most important variable in any domestic situation, right? I think the lack of either being able to laugh at yourself right. or accepting somebody to poke a little bit fun at you, uh, fun at you is, uh, is pretty, uh, uh, pretty paramount to a solid relationship. What do you do to keep really good health? Well, I thank my parents. <laughs> uh, I get an annual physical. I try to exercise. I, I'm not as good as Ted Doan, who's my hero in terms of religious address to uh, fitness. What a guy. But I try to do uh, uh, an exercise program. Traveling this really beats, you uh, up. beats me up along those lines. But I don't do anything special. Uh, I guess I try to pay attention. I got a flu shot as a case in point. But did, did nothing you, special, really. What I'm interested in is do the values of one culture transcend to another? So what your parents taught you are those words that you live by, and if so, what are they? Or did you have to transmute or drop or choose other kinds of values? No, I don't think so. I think, at, and, and the hope for this old human race of ours is that at the end of the day, the same economic, social, and political truths should be good for all of us. And if they're not, we ought to check the truths that we hold as sacred. And I don't care what your ethnicity or your religion or your national origin or your economic persuasion may be. I think the same rules apply. And uh, uh, while things change, 
uh, the principles shouldn't. The realities change as technology and the world changes. But I think the principles remain the same, and I think they're uh, pretty inviolate. Uh, understanding them, getting them right, testing them is important, but I think they pass muster. How do you, uh, when grief hits, and sometimes grief is a death of someone, sometimes it's a really hard situation, um, what goes on inside you? How, how do you... Well, that's a time when I need some privacy, for mm -hmm. sure. It's happened, and uh, uh, I need some privacy. But then it's like everything else. You look back, and uh, uh, life is terminal. Sometimes it's too soon. Uh, sometimes it's too late. Uh, I've watched friends and family anguish for a long time, uh, and uh, uh, the grieving can come... Uh, as you say, attendant to a death, or it can come by witnessing a hardship in life. But I think if you step back, get a little privacy, and then look at the virtues of the individual, and some of the vices, they're there for all of us, uh, I think you begin to accept the fact that uh, most people, especially if, you're, if you're, they're your friends, and you're your friends for the right reasons, they've done a fair amount with their life, and. Uh, the Bob Nagleys of this world, I used to say every time I went by the cemetery, damn you, Bob Nagley, for going right. so soon. But then again, I think about Bob and all the good things he did and the way he did them, and uh, you felt pretty good about it. What do you like? What attracts you to people as a friend? Oh, gee, uh, I don't know. Uh, to me, that's a magic reaction. Uh, uh, I think that's a degree area of chemistry that I don't even pretend to understand. Uh, it's complex to the point where you see somebody and you say, I like that person, and I don't know why. Some of my friends are far from perfect, and some people who are very perfect, or at least seem that way, I don't count as people that I'm real close to. So uh, uh, I'm afraid that's way too complex for me, Tunia. Uh, Friendship is a magic thing, and uh, uh, I don't pick my friends scientifically. Uh, I think none of us really have much success at that. Uh, I think friendship happens. How do you think? Um, for friendship, I, I'm drawn to people if I feel they have something to say, or if they experience the world in a... Um, um, I don't want to say exalted, I don't exactly mean that, but in a full manner, that, that um, they examine what happens to them or to the situation, that they take seriously. Sure, um, sure. That's, that's a great uh, uh, parameter. I'm afraid a lot of my friends would not qualify on that basis, but, right. uh, you know, uh, the redeeming virtues are hard to define, and sometimes you don't know them right away. Right. Uh, you meet somebody, and uh, you think you'd like to get to know them better well before you really get to know them at all. So uh, I don't have a real good answer for you on that one. I, I think I have a fair number of friends, and yet if I look at any common traits, I have a hard time saying. Sometimes you send, I think for me, since uh, goodness, I have a friend out in Oklahoma who used to be a sheriff. And Those are good friends. And, <laughs> really. And one day he sent me this antique, and I wouldn't thank him for it until I found out what it was. And it took me months to find out what it was. And it was a hog scraper, oh. which you take the, but anyway, I the, finally the wrote it, I thank you. Yeah. And he called me up and he said, how did you figure it out? <laughs> because our worlds were so different. But I think the sense of goodness and celebration sure. of life sure. between us sure. was there. Sure. And, uh, and, and his wife, too, and some kind of um, <clears throat> decency. So, I've spent a lot of time with the environmental community uh, as part of, uh, uh, obviously, my responsibilities at Dow and uh, as... Uh, an area of interest going forward. And it's amazing how uh, in this area, which is contentious, uh, certainly between the CEO of a chemical company and the uh, 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 
most ardent uh, 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 environmentalists in quotes, there's a lot of area for disagreement. But you find yourself uh, making friends and maybe uh, failing to make a connection with someone who perhaps is far more like-minded than you are. And that's a reality I always come back to. Uh, uh, how can I get along with this person where our views are so different? Right. Uh, and where we don't agree on a lot of Maybe things. Maybe your value systems are similar. And I say to myself, well, they're entitled, and maybe I'll learn something, and maybe I've got a chance to uh, do a little uh, preaching on my favorite subject. So uh, you walk into a room, and uh, uh, you never know what the outcome is going to be. But you've got to give it a chance. In the book of your life, what, what chapter would you say you're in now? <laughs> uh, well, uh, let's hope it's a trilogy and I'm right. in volume one, but, right. uh, you know, I, uh, uh, I'm at that point where I'm pleased with some of the things I've accomplished. I'm still working pretty much full time uh, on a variety of things. I control my in-basket more than ever I have. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I work on what I want to work on. Uh, corporate boards notwithstanding, uh, my areas of interest I have more say over than when I was working right. full time. Right. But uh, I'd like to think I'm at a phase where uh, maybe I can give back a lot more than uh, I ever thought I could. I like to teach, and I teach at my old university. I've just finished a three-year hitch there. I really enjoyed that. I've got a couple of other opportunities along those lines. Uh, I'm at the stage where uh, I've gotten a lot and it's time to give something back. And uh, I hope uh, since I uh, would like to stick around for a while, I have a lot to give back and it takes a while. But uh, that's kind of where I am. What do you, th what, what kinds of things make you laugh that you think are funny? Humor. Well, I, you know, uh, uh, they say humor has a national origin. Uh, some people uh, fall when the, f laugh when the fellow falls off the ladder. Other people laugh when they see something warm and cuddly. I'm, I guess I'm in neither category. Uh, humor is funny when it's topical. Mm -hmm. when it doesn't hurt anybody, mm -hmm. and when it's novel and creative. I think those three things, you put them together, and uh, if you're reading the paper or watching television, uh, mm -hmm. check those three variables. Is it novel? Uh, is it uh, harmless? And uh, uh, is it something that you can relate to? How do you keep yourself informed? Well... Uh, that's getting easier and easier. I mean, we are in sort of an information overload. And mm -hmm. I think my biggest challenge is selectivity. Mm -hmm. So I scan a lot, but I'm pretty selective in what I really read for retention. Uh, and once in a while I need a break and I need to read a novel. Uh, but uh, keeping appraised is not difficult in today's environment. Being selective and having the time to study those things in depth that uh, are either germane or interesting, I think that's the real challenge. I know you, for instance, got very interested in Islam in the aftermath of 9-11. So did I, and I read up and it was fascinating. I really love history. If the truth were known, I never told Dow recruiters this, I had as many credits in history as I did in chemistry as an undergraduate. I love history. That's my principal area of reading. And uh, of course, history is very current these days. Uh, so staying informed is not hard. So you think we learn from the past of experience? Boy, do we ever. Do we ever. I want to thank Frank for being with us today. Frank has shared quite generously of his life and his thoughts, and we've learned several important things. And when you migrate from one culture to another, it is difficult at the first, but if you have parents who support that move, that you take that point of view as a good one. 
that it's important to invest yourself in your career with the best you have. The people are of the greatest essence, and while they may give you a hard time at some points, if you try and see things from their point of view, they will try to go to a more neutral and supportive position. As a leader, you need to convey um, your sense of mission and what you expect of them, but also it's important to pause and to ask them for a good solid feedback on, on what's going on. And though Frank says he's uh, much of a talker, perhaps he takes in a great deal while he is talking and he's just sensing, perhaps even energetically, what's happening. Um, he pays attention to his health. He stays modest through uh, uh, family life, which asks him probably to take out the garbage and more, although he didn't say that. And um, he tries to remember that life isn't just about what you get, but what you give. And so he is in a time in his life where, as he said, he has more control in his inbox to give more across the, um, the areas of, of his interests, which uh, recently in the last few years have included teaching. So I really want to thank Frank. I hope you, when you see him around town, you'll thank him for uh, joining and for sharing. And remember his important point. When tough times hit, you know, you do have a pause. You do think things over. You ask yourself what went wrong, but also, uh, why didn't I do something sooner? And then you act. You cannot have all the data before you act. So please think that over. And remember, kindness counts. Do something sweet for someone you know today and someone you don't know. And be sure to do that every day. Thank you so much. And join us another time. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Junior. To share your comments and suggestions, contact Junior. The email address is juniordone at aol.com or write to post office box 169 midland michigan 48640